a very good morning ladies and gentlemen and all the viewers today i welcome you all in the second edition of orange city literature fest organized by sgr knowledge foundation i am tupil sharif the anchor for this session the session is of 40 minutes and there will be a buzzer in the end the topic for the session is let's talk about food as history and i am very pleased to welcome the speaker for the session madam kaumdi marathe ma'am ma'am is a trained as a journalist in bombay and worked as a reporter and a feature writer there from 1990 to 1996 after moving to the us she had put to her career on hold because of some visa issues but despite of that nothing stopped her to shine there also instead she, she spent her time learning about food researching food history writing two books for indian publishers and occasionally reporting on the usa for india media outlets in 2007 after legally getting her green card and other efforts also ma'am uh, ma'am opened an uncurry a cooking school and a catering company which featured organic regional indian food and became the first person to set the record straight about indian food in the west she tested recipes uh, during the day and that the night she wrote the manuscript of the essentials marathi cookbook which was published by the penguin india in 2009 She also wrote for the publications like Paste, Forbes. dot com, LA Parent, and Moms. dot me, and read, analyzed novels and scripts for E One, a Los Angeles production company, and offered communication services to public storage and other corporate uh, clients also. Mam's food memorial shared shared tables, family stories, and recipes from Pune to LA. Speaking Tiger Books was published in May two thousand seventeen. Mam is currently works as a senior book editor for America's Test Kitchen in Boston, MA, and writes children's fiction in her spare time. She also enjoys taking photographs of flowers and wherever she goes, and happen watching cinemas of all genres. She is also at work on her first novel. We welcome you, Mam. I also introduce the moderator for this session, R.J. Nisha. She is a radio jock and has been awarded as the best jock of the city. and the best female jock of maharashtra by big fm but for her the best award is when she gets a call or a message saying hey nisha you bring a smile on my uh, on my face every morning indeed that is true so with the same positive energy we welcome you ma'am and i shall hand over the session over to you nisha ma'am thank you thank you so much sharif and hi mirajul ma'am it's an honor uh, being a moderator for your session because you have been doing fab work and I am really amazed to know that इतना काम आप कैसे मैनेज कर लेती हैं मतलब मतलब नौ देवी की जो कहते हैं ना रूप आपके अंदर समा चुके हैं कि आप इधर खाना पका रही हैं इधर यू हैव सेंसिंग सेंसेशंस एंड यू आर लुकिंग एट द नेचर्स योर फोटोग्राफी स्किल्स योर राइटिंग स्किल्स आई मीन आई एम जस्ट ऑड बाय यू कि हाउ डू यू रियली मैनेज टू डू दैट बट एज इट से माय पेरेंट्स गिव मी दैट एनर्जी सो Absolutely, as you rightly said, your parents gave you the energy. I would really like to know something about your childhood. I mean, like I remember that if I can cook today well enough, it's because I used to sit on the kitchen table and just smell the food what my mom used to prepare. And even today, when I make it, I'll be like, "Ha, huh, this is something smelling similar, so it's going to be fine." How has your childhood been, and how has food come to you? Like you know that you never wanted to be a chef, as I've known about you. So right. how did this happen? Uh, how did it happen? Um, I ate lots of good food growing up. And um, my first food memory is from the age of one. I remember my great grandmother putting some rock sugar into my hand, so I literally have that taste of that sweetness from from a very early age. But no, I never wanted to cook. Uh, I wanted to be a writer, and that was thanks to my mother too. Uh, but when she was in the kitchen cooking, I would be there reading a book, and um, not not interested in cooking at all. My brother was the one who was baking or cooking with her. Um my ex-husband likes to joke that when we got married the very next day I went to the kitchen and started cooking. And the reason I was able to do that I think was because I had by osmosis um learned from my mother and my grandmothers. And so I just experimented. Um I started to cook, but it wasn't until we moved to the United States and I got tired of being said told, "Oh, you're Indian, we love curry." um that that's when i really started researching food history and as you know and i know there's no such thing called curry in india nobody uses curry powder and so i wanted to set the record straight i wanted to tell people 
that Indian food is diverse. Um, it is very region specific. Uh, you could travel the entire length and breadth of the country and never eat the same meal twice your whole life. Um, and so when I was able, I started on curry to shatter the myth that all Indian food was curry. Yeah, here. That you never wanted to be a chef. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Okay, I hope now I'm coming. Cool? Uh, Kind of, you're cutting in and out. Okay, I'll try and speak slow in that manner. So, that's um, so when you just said that uh, one person sitting in the kitchen and reading up a book always, how did this happen? You took up writing as a passion for yourself. That we, when we sit down to write, we've got so many things to the mind, and we're really not able to decide on what to down. Is this line going to be fitting it up, or you scribble it up and say, nah? You need to have something more beautiful than this. How did you start up writing and what is the best way to start writing, if I have to ask you? Uh, the best way to start writing is to write every day. And uh, I learned that the hard way. Uh, when I was nine, we moved to Canada. Like my father was going to do a PhD at a university there. And my mother said, um, we are in a foreign country. This was 1977. Um, you are going to have experiences that you would never have living in India. And I want you to write a page a day. Well, I didn't like to write. I was nine. I didn't want to be doing that. And she said, no, you have to do that. So if we go to the ballet or if you go to a library or you go to the park, write about that. Write your experiences down. Um, and so I started doing that. And within a year, I had realized that my journal was my friend. So it didn't really matter. I moved my whole life, my whole childhood, I moved. And so I never had one friend in one place, a best friend. We were always shifting homes. And so my journal became my best friend. It became a place for me to write down what I was thinking, what I was feeling. And so um, that was what I liked to do. So I decided to go to journalism school. And I went to journalism school where I learned the techniques and the skills of radio journalism, TV, um, as well as print journalism. And then I worked as a reporter at the Free Press Journal in Bombay. So then I learned to write on a schedule. You've got oh, God. A, to write a story that has to appear the next day in the paper. So you learn to work quickly. So I think of writing as a jigsaw puzzle. You're taking words and ideas and putting them together. And once they fit like a jigsaw puzzle, all the pieces are there then you've got the story, you've got what you want to say, and usually find that it works really well. Um, I've been reading about you where you rightly said that you love gazing through the windows and you <laughs> love to see what is doing outside. Do really people cook for each other? Do you really like to see that, you know, if you could see somewhere across the window, someone serving food to each other, sitting on a table, having some good time. What is that best time of yours when you can gaze out of the window? And what thoughts pour into your view? So the thing is, I've always felt like a foreigner wherever, wherever I am. So I was born in Pune, but I hardly lived there. I lived in different parts of India. I lived in Wales. I lived in Canada and then the U.S. So I was always, um, and I'm a journalist, so I was always looking in, looking in, as it were, to other people's houses. So when I'm walking the street, down the street, I look and see if somebody's house, I like the lights in there, the furniture looks interesting, people walking around talking, their children playing. I, it's not like I'm being creepy. <laughs> I'm not like, mm, what are you doing? But it's nice to look into houses. Right now, for instance, where I live in California, all the Christmas lights are up. So it's lovely to walk past yes. in, in the evening um, and look at the lights, the trees in the, in the living room windows. It just gives you a, um, a little glimpse into somebody else's life. And uh, that's very interesting to me. So that's what I meant when I wrote that in the book. So uh, ma'am, if you had to ask you about like the food and the history, what is that certain aspect you would like to tell us about, you know, the misconceptions we have about food? Like, for example, like everyone said that curry is from India and you broke it out and there's a lot more than curry just being there or served on the plate. So what are some kind of more interesting news to you or say interesting topics you discovered saying that there is so much in our country that we really need to understand about food. It's just it's important. What do you have to say about that? 
Um, yes, there's a lot we need to understand about food in India as well as abroad about India. And I think when you're in the West, um, the idea of food from different cultures, whether it's Korea or India or Japan, um, is, um, is very West centric, the way they look at it. And I think that now in this day and age, people are beginning to think about how we can honor culinary traditions from different parts of the world. And I'm happy right. to be part of that. So when I wrote the Essential Marathi Cookbook, for instance, um, nobody had written a book about Marathi food uh, in English. Uh, mm. And I wanted to do that because I lived away from my grandmothers and mother, and I wanted to, to learn about my history. And so I interviewed them. I interviewed great aunts. I interviewed my grandmother. I talked to friends who were from Maharashtra. Um, asked them what the food meant to them that they were cooking. Um, and it's very, not only region specific, but it's also religion specific, caste specific. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot about just my state um, in writing that book. So we've got Muslim recipes, Hindu recipes, Christian recipes in the book um, from different parts of the country where say for instance Nagpur, the food that you eat there, my mother's family is from Nagpur, is very different from the food of Pune or the food that my father's okay. parents ate. And so it was really interesting to learn about that. Spices, India is known for its spices, but the spices in every part of India are different. So um, I've enjoyed mm -hmm. learning about that and having Uncurry, you know, the catering company, um, what I was offering was, I'm not gonna give you chicken tikka masala and aloo, pan aloo gobi, yes. you know, matar paneer, because you can get that at an Indian restaurant. You can get really good quality food. You can get naan. But if you do ask right. me to make naan, I will give you the best possible naan you will ever have. I will give you the best chicken tikka masala you will ever have. But I'd rather suggest to you food from Kerala or food from Andhra Pradesh or food from Bengal. And what I would do when I was doing catering gigs like that was actually go in and do the research. So how do you do poshto? How do you do um, panch? How do you use panch puran when you're making chicken or potatoes, how, what do, you know, how do you make a korambo from up Tamil Nadu? So I would do that research and then I would incorporate those recipes into my repertoire. So when people would call me and say, could we see a menu? I'd say, I have no menu for you. I will cater to what you want. Are you traveling to India? Where are you going? I'll cook food for you from that state. Um, so it was very specific and it was a way for people here to discover food that they'd never eaten before. So people would come to my cooking classes, for instance, and say, we've never eaten food like this. Well, you would eat it if you went to somebody's house. Wow. Yeah. So when you have a catering business, it's kind of a bit difficult for you also because people have a certain expectations and certain tastes in their mind, you know, that when you talk about, say, paneer tikka, so I would always remember that first in Malai paneer tikka, which was being served to me or which has to be smoky flavored. And I would mm -hmm. still, you know, still have that kind of a taste being found somewhere. And it makes me relax. But when people come and ask you, they talk about it. Was it easy to convince them that, you know, you've been really researching on food and boss, like, you know, you have something more to try in life? Or is it like people are still adamant on their taste buds and saying that, no, Marathi ma'am, we want this way and you bhindi masala is like this, or you should also be like this, or you should also How is it all together? Um, I think that because most of my clients were not Indian, they were happy to discover new foods. Um, and there were some who still wanted the chicken tikka masala. Um, like I said, I would give them the best chicken tikka masala they've ever eaten. But they were also happy to explore. So I would say, for instance, can we do this Rajasthani pickled chicken? It is the closest thing I've found to chicken tikka that's Indian. Um, and it's from Rajasthan. Would you like to try that? And very often they would say yes. And so they try that and they say this is delicious. You know, I'm so glad I discovered this. Um, and even when I had Indian clients, Indian clients would say to me, for instance, there was a Gujarati man married to an American woman and it was his mother's 75th birthday. So they asked me to come in and cook. Um, so sh I made Shrikhand, Puri, Patata Bhaji, um, and so on for them. And <laughs> it's funny, half of their guests were Indian and half were not. Everybody enjoyed the food. The mother loved the Shrikhand Puri. And the Indian guests who literally just come from India, they came in to see who the Bhavarji was. Like, 
they expected somebody, so they expected a young man or somebody there cooking and they saw me and they did a double take. I was like, okay, you're cooking? Yes, I'm cooking. And I will make you <laughs> that puri and shrikhand and you will enjoy it. So, yeah, it's fun. The element of surprise. <laughs> Do you, you had any of the moments that there into your life when you were catching that, oh God, why did I take up this kind of this order? This was not supposed to be me. I am stuck here. Have there been any moments such as those also? Um, no, there have been moments of exhaustion. So when I do a catering gig, for instance, a 16 hour day, I do all the cooking because obviously I, I can hire wait staff. I can hire somebody who serves the wine, uh, but nobody knows how to cook Indian food, right? Except the people who are already working restaurants. So I would do all the cooking myself. So whether it was for 400 people or two people, um, everything, lifting the meat, cutting the meat, making the seasonings, everything was me. And then I had servers who at the catering gig do the serving and so on. So I had some help there. But yeah, that was exhausting. So you'd go to bed at night, at midnight after a gig and think, oh my gosh, you know, this is exhausting. But I never felt like I didn't want to do it. So it's, it's the passion for food that drives you on to cook on for 16 hours a day. <laughs> it did. I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> I'm writing about food. <laughs> so I'm editing cookbooks. So. so, I mean, like that, that's really crazy as, you know, to understand that someone doing that for about 16 hours and, you know, managing everything one on one. Because if we even have guests at home, we really get so panicked about it. You will be cooking for around 400 people, not many. That's, that's something uh, a female like you only could do, and I would say that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> talking about you know your beautiful journey, Indian food is not just about curry, which you said, and you have a beautiful setting called Ankari. How did Ankari happen to you? Like, you know, why did you choose this name? Was, was it something reason specific that you had to say that there is a lot more than curry of India that you really guys need to know? So how did Aunt Curry just happen to you? Um, so a friend of mine and I were working on a restaurant idea a long time ago. So 2005, 2006, when our kids were very little. And um, we thought about having a restaurant that served food, kind of like a Mexican restaurant or, you know, but it was food to go. So it would be a bowl. So you'd have rice, you'd have some Indian uh, vegetables or lentils on top. You'd have um, a raita you know, over the top, tamarind chutney, mint chutney, cilantro chutney. And we were trying to think of a name for that. And we thought of uncurried because, like I said, when people would meet me and they say, oh, you're Indian, we love curry. And I would say, what is that? And so I didn't want to have that word. So if people say to me, oh, can you make a curry? And I say, I don't know what you mean. Because in India, we have very specific names for food, right? So sautéed potatoes or potatoes in sauce. So batata chibhaji or batata sarasa or um, bhadliwangi, you know, stuffed eggplant. So there's very specific names in different parts of the country for each dish. And everything's made seasonally. Everything's made with different spices. There's so much nuance and so many differences that to just say something's a curry, is really um, insulting. And so I wanted, like I said, I had a cooking school too. So I wanted to shatter the myth that Indian food was curry because we got the word curry from the British who, as you know, ruled India. And they said, oh, you know, Mother Joffrey tells a story. Somebody said, oh, this is delicious. How did you make it? And the cook said, oh, I just threw together some spices and I made it curry. And they said, oh, a curry, really, that sounds delicious. And so they took the curry powder, that blend of spices, back to England in the 16th century and then started making everything with it. So you'd make lentils with that same powder. You'd make vegetables with that same powder. Nobody does that in India. So everything tastes the same. But it's Indian to other people, but it's not Indian to us. When I smell curry powder, I say, ugh, no. I don't want this. I will never use it because the spicing is all wrong. There's turmeric in there. There's salt in there. There's celery seed in there, which I would never have in a spice blend. When you make garam masala, you don't put turmeric in it, right? So it was all wrong. And so the idea for uncurry was born with trying to shatter this myth of Indian food being curry. 
the, that's the main reason that you actually are right there to tell people that there is lots more over a cup of curry rather than just calling Indians as a curry. But uh, how when you when you say that you love writing, you've been into the editing, you've been into it, which is your favorite rather than not just food actually. You, know, you really love writing about this, this not just food that day. Sorry, I can't. You're cutting in and out, so I'm not sure what you said. I'll, I'll repeat it again. I said, uh, we know that you have been into writing for a long. So if mm -hmm. I had to ask you that, not just about the food, but is there any other mm -hmm. topic which really attracts you that you really need to write about this? And there is something which attracts you every time on this particular topic and say that you sit down and you pen down some of your thoughts. What would that be specifically? Um, I think um, it would be human interactions. So I meet a lot of interesting people and I think my eyes are open to people. So when I'm walking down the street or in the subway or driving down the freeway, I look at people and people look at me and they smile and I smile and we talk. And I've learned so many interesting things by talking to people that their stories are what I like to tell. And the reason I wrote the memoir, it's called Family Stories, right, um, was because I had been hearing these stories my whole childhood. Uh, from my grandmother, my grandfather, my great grandfather, you know, just different stories about their lives. And they were fascinating to me. And I wanted to put them down in one place. So if you look at the book, for instance, there's pictures in there of my great grandparents and uh, uncles and aunts. And, you know, they're very interesting uh, to me because it was a way to, again, learn about my history because I didn't grow up there. And so the way people are and the things they say and the lives they've lived those stories are really important to me and that's what I like to write about. When you sit down for editing certain kinds of work, do you feel that there is still more works by the youngsters which has to be done where you can actually sit and say them that look, dude, uh, this is the old school of journalism and you need to really follow some of the tactics when you sit down to write. You just can't just, just keep on writing and writing because it takes a lot of time to write a book and then re-edit the work. So how does it happen mm -hmm. to you? Like, you know, do you read up the whole thing and then you're like, okay, fine, let me edit those certain things. Or what would you like to give the advice to the people who write, keep on writing and then they find it so difficult to edit their own work? Um, advice to young writers, budding writers. Is that what you're, what you're saying? Um, if you like to write, uh, I think we started off this session talking about it. If you like to write, do it every day. And uh, doing it every day, you will find what works, what doesn't work, what you like to write about, what you said well day before yesterday that you might use again. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from writing, you need to read. So if you want to be a writer, read. Read other writers and see what they've said, how they've said it, whether it's Dostoevsky or MFK Fisher or Tennyson. Read poetry, read um, fiction, read nonfiction. Read the newspaper, not just uh, the Bollywood news or whatever it is, but uh, really articles about politics and adventure and science and, you know, health. And explore what works for you, what really you're interested in, and then keep writing it. As for editing, yes, if you're working on a book, you can keep editing, but don't let yourself get hung up on that. If you decide that you want to write a chapter, for instance, Roald Dahl, who wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, he had a rule that he would write 500 words every day. And once he'd written those 500 words, then he could go in and edit, um, change things around. But he used to write by hand with pencil on a notepad. And he'd go off into his, he had a shed in his back garden. He'd go there, he'd write uh, till lunchtime, and then he'd come out and he'd live the rest of his life. So as long as you have discipline and control, you can A, get something written, and B, then be critical with yourself. So when you're editing, just because I, I had a journalism professor, a, a film professor in um, at school in Bombay, who would say, kill your darlings. So kill your babies. The things that you love the most, kill. So when you've written something, you love the way you've said something. Does that really work for that story, for that blog, for that newspaper article? See, don't just keep it because, oh, I loved how I wrote it. You know, think about it. And if you need to, kill it, cut it. And very often, um, you'll find that when you're writing for a newspaper, uh, you have a limited amount that you can write, right? 
And back in the day when I used to write, I had um, a, 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 an employer, C.Y. Gopinath, who is a writer, um, who would say, make sure your second last paragraph is really good. Because in those days, we used to cut and paste. So people would um, set the type for a newspaper. It wasn't compu It wasn't digital, right? And so if something wasn't fitting, they would just cut that last paragraph off. And so the end of your story wouldn't exist. But if you'd written your second last paragraph as the end of the story, then you would still be intact. So that was good advice he gave me, and I'm giving that to prospective writers who are listening. Um, that make sure that you you say everything you want to say in the in the body of your article and make sure you work really hard on the beginning and the end to so that they're re interesting they're intriguing the reader wants to see what you have, are going to say so that that reminds me that the generation who is uh, you know every second person today wants to become a food blogger post mm -hmm. them on the insta stories and actually say and call themselves as the food bloggers of the city but what exactly does a food blogger really mean? And what are you supposed to do? Because if I am around in the city, I just take a picture of what I eat and say that I am a food blogger because I know the ingredients and I've tasted this here. That really doesn't make me a food blogger what I believe in. What is a food blogger and how are you supposed to, you know, have a proper version of blogging? If what you could just put some kind of a, you know, a roshni dal de gera bispratse though. <laughs> um, I think uh, food blogging um, is something that you have to work at, just like anything else. So if you're, you used to be a journalist, now you're a food blogger. Um, so you have to make sure that what you're writing is interesting, makes sense, draws people in. If you're writing about food, then you want it to be tantalizing. Um, it smells good. It tastes good. You get a sense of, oh my goodness, this pie that this person is eating is really uh, appealing. I want to eat that too. So yes, that's photography. And then when you write about it, you make it so evocative and um, attractive that somebody really wants to eat it. So you do that, but you have to work hard at it. It doesn't come easy. It's not uh, like photography. You have to work at it every day. So it's not just going to be the Insta stories and the uh, the kind of filters you just put on the food and say that I'm a food blogger for the day. <laughs> well, you can be a food blogger, but you may not have a following. Absolutely. So, now it's like, you know, you miss home when you're abroad, and if someone serves you a dal chawal, What is your favorite food? I mean, I I know that you've been cooking so much of food, and you've been knowing every small detail. But if it comes to your favorites, what is that? Um, I have a lot of favorites, as you can imagine. Uh, but I think if I had to pick one, I would pick my mother's mother's uh, tomato coconut soup, I call it, uh, or it's called santosh, which means contentment. Um, and she would make that for me every mm -hmm. summer, the first day that I arrived for summer vacation. Um, there would be santosh, there would be rice, tup, ghee. Um, and I loved eating that. I could eat my fill of it. I can still taste it. What she used to make, I can still taste. So when I'm cooking, I'm trying to replicate what she's made or my mother's made. And I can replicated to the point where, okay, I know this tastes just like Ajis. Um, and that for me brings me the most contentment, the most satisfaction is eating that tomato coconut soup. So will, will that be a possibility that we could actually taste it from your hands rather than not just hearing it up? Because that sounds really tempting now. Uh, so what was the question? <laughs> I said that when would we be able to just uh, taste that food from your hand? Because the way you've been wow. describing it, it's really tempting. <laughs> um, I used to dream about doing a pop-up in India. Um, and maybe one day that'll happen. So you, maybe you'll have to come to Bombay. Or I can come to Nagpur, my, where my mother's from, and do a, do a pop-up yes. there. So Nagpur is really famous for its Saudi version of food. And Tarri Poha is the best thing what you can be served here. So which is your kind of a memory with the Nagpur cuisine? And you think that this can be also taken abroad and being served out there with Saudi tip going at an international level? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, I mean, I, I, there's more food in India than I can do anything with. So there's room for everybody to uh, cook, to share. But just be sure to share share a story or the roots of the food, you know. I want to know what Saudi 
food is. I want to know, um, did your grandmother teach you that? Or for instance, in my cookbook, I got recipes from different contributors from different parts of the state. And so I asked them stories. Tell me who, where you learned this recipe. Um, did you learn it from your grandmother or your grandfather? Is it affected by the place where you live? Are you on the seashore, like in the Konkan? So do you use coconut? Are you in Nagpur? Do you use more um, peanuts, jaggery, that kind of thing? So um, yeah, come come here and cook for people. They love it. So we're going to be trying that soon with you. But we have a quick question for you. Like, like for every author or writer, it is a task for them to present the character in a way that a reader can imagine see the character or see in front of them. So how was your experience about writing the books related to food and particularly Indian food? So that's a question which has just come up. Okay, so what was the question? I'm sorry. Um, it's like, you know, you need to write it in certain manner that we can start imagining the characters of what you've been describing up. So mm -hmm. how was your experience about writing the books which are related to food, particularly Indian food? So how was the experience altogether? For me, the writing experience. Okay, it was uh, it was very interesting. The cookbook, well, I've got a copy of one of the cookbooks. This cookbook, when I was writing this, I was interviewing people from different parts of the state. So I was interacting with them, learning from them, and I was testing every recipe um, so that uh, then I could go back and ask questions like, did you really put this much salt in it or um, coriander seed or whatever it was? Um, so I engaged with them and I learned more about them, their community, their religion, as um, I worked on the book. And then once the book was done, I came to India and actually cooked with some of those people. So we traveled, my parents and I traveled around Maharashtra, we traveled in Bombay, cooked with the people who had contributed to my book. And that was really enlightening to learn about food from them directly. Um, when I was writing the memoir, um, I was... <laughs> My mother loved to tell stories, so she used to tell a story every night and lots of stories about her growing up and stories about her grandfather and her father and so on. So for me, it was a question of bringing all those stories together. So I thought, oh, I have so many stories. It's going to be a book just, you know, yeah, it's going to be so many pages. And I wrote it down and it was maybe six pages. So I thought, now what do I do? And so I started researching each of those grandparents the time that they lived, um, the politics of that time, the history of that time, and that is what gave me satisfaction, gave me joy, and and made the book. That, that's very interesting that, you know, I, I take away I get from you is you need to start observing people. So if you're a good person, you can observe things around you, you can actually send down. Okay? Daily write up a journal for yourself so that you can actually help up in remembering and recollecting those things. Whatever you love the most, uh, do not try to keep that. Just kill that anyway, so that you can actually have a proper thing to you. And the foremost thing is, whatever you're writing, uh, reach out to the history for it. So if you can connect all these things, you can actually become a good writer. Yep, well, reach out to the history, but also connect it to your world. Why are you eating okay. bao bhaji or vada pao or, you know, what, what, what is, is it convenient? Is it tasty? Why do you like it? Think about that. Explore the, the reasons why you like something, whether it's food or it's science or it's something else. Um, and then do, do your research, do your uh, due diligence. So it, it was a really wonderful session actually talking to Marathi Ma'am and understanding that how you're supposed to write and how you're supposed to cook food. I mean, both of the things together uh, was not a part of me because I really can't manage both the things together. But now I'll try mm -hmm. doing that as per your advice. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. It's been fun talking. We have a very beautiful uh, tagline called the Zach Marathi Mam. It's called Badaki Badeko because the radio station which I work with. So, uh -huh. um, you know, Orange City Literature Festival has really turned this one moment of your life which i would say what would that be a moment in my life that changed it is that what you're saying yeah, yeah. um i would say the birth of my daughter because in a way I was connecting to my history, but also to my future. And um, in her, I could see my father, I could see myself, 
uh, when she turned five, for instance, was the first time I saw myself in her. Um, and as she grows, she's 19 now, but as she gro goes through life, um, I learn more about my connection to my family and I am watching her grow and watching her make her own path. So I think that was the moment that changed my life. How beautiful is it? So thank you so much for actually being with us. And thank you so much, Sharif, for actually giving us uh, the intonation and also the question for ma'am. And uh, it's really an honor to, uh, you know, be with you, Marathi ma'am, because you've got so much to learn from you. And I've got the best five takeaways from you today. So I'll always be remembering this throughout my life. <laughs> Till the time I meet you and have that coconut uh, santosh from you. <laughs> thank you. I look forward to that. Thank you. This was very enjoyable, Disha. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a very really good time here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, definitely today we learned a lot of things about Indian curry and definitely will not use that word again. Curry will definitely tell them it's not a, just a curry. We are taking a lot of things today. Thank you so much, ma'am. On behalf of Orange City Literature Festival, I we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the sessions and knowledge shared with us. Thank you so much, Arjun Isha, for this mod for moderating this session. Also, uh, we also thank the publisher, Speaking Tiger. I also say uh, like to mention we have another session with Soren Desai from 12 p.m. Thank you so much. Twenty years of existence, two universities, twenty-three educational institutes. Offering 137 courses. Sony Group of Institutions. A vision beyond.